Thank you for checking out the Media Marketing Podcast, a place where you can learn all things media and marketing related. Don't miss a beat in boosting your business and your brand. In each episode, you'll gain valuable insights, tools, and strategies to apply to your marketing efforts. And now your host, Brian Cargill. All right, we're here at Ava Rosteria in Lake Oswego, Oregon. I'm joined with by Phil Bernstein, who has been working with local advertisers since 1995. He's experienced in radio, television, print, and digital marketing. Whatever the medium, Phil's goal is always the same, to help local businesses connect with their customers, deliver a compelling message, and make more sales. Phil spent nine years on the road as a national consultant, working with advertisers in markets as big as Denver, Orlando, and Washington, D.C. Markets as small as Hastings, Nebraska, and Minot, 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 North Dakota. I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow back on that and hear, hear a good not, story out not, of that. Yeah, yeah Minot, <laughs> and everything in between. These days, Phil is back in Portland, working with small and medium-sized businesses on behalf of iHeartMedia. The technology has changed in the past 25 years, but human nature has not. Today, we'll talk about what advertisers need to pay attention to, the most common mistakes advertisers make, and how to make sure your marketing dollar is working as hard as it can. That is an awesome introduction. Thank you, Phil, for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you are my first guest on the Media Marketing Podcast. Awesome. So no pressure. I'll try not to screw it up. (laughs) There we go. You'll do fine. You'll do fine. Um, So maybe uh, we could talk about our background. Um, So we originally met through Toastmasters. I remember you gave a speech talking about uh, marketing, I think um, kind of piggybacking on, we'll get into it in a second, but your uh, The Seven Deadly Advertising Mistakes ebook. Do you remember doing that speech? I do. I do, as a matter of fact. And just a brief uh, why I joined Toastmasters. Years ago, um, the company I was working for did a deal with a professional speaking coach. And as part of that deal, as part of the program that they did with us, they videotaped us giving speeches. And I thought I was pretty good. But I had a teacher once tell me, uh, recording devices are God's way of telling you you suck. And when I looked back at that tape, I saw all I was doing was talking to my feet. I was looking down the entire time. And I went and I joined Toastmasters the next week. Uh, I felt I needed uh, help communicating with people better, and it has been a tremendous help in, in my work and, uh, and everything I do. Oh man, that is huge, and that's great advice because, yeah, the camera tells all. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't really hide from it. If you it have doesn't any, lie. Like, <laughs> it doesn't lie. If you have any li- weird nuances, you know, you hear, you see people do all kinds of things. So that's great, and I guess a little backstory for people that don't know what Toastmasters is. Um, it's a public speaking group, you know, a very supportive environment that allows you to, uh, you know, they have various types of speaking where you can do impromptu as well as prepared speeches. But yeah, it's been great. How long have you been with Toastmasters? I've so probably about 10 years. Wow. In, uh, in a couple of different clubs. But ultimately, I work, I work in advertising, I work in marketing, I'm in the persuasion and communication business. And that's what Toastmasters is about, is getting better persuasion and communication. So it all fits together. And uh, what I do with local businesses is help them do a better job of persuading people to do business with them. That's what it's about. That's great. Do you, um, I mean, persuasion can be kind of a, uh, you know, twofold word, I think, a lot of times, but um, I think business owners do like hearing that, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, hearing that you're able to uh, kind of coerce or uh, convince people to buy their product, right? Not not coerce, usually not coerce, (laughs) but but convince. Yeah. And and part of it is you know, is is getting people to pay attention to you, uh, to believe what you're saying, and then to take an action. And there's nothing fancy about it. Uh, you know, the principles are the same as they were 50 years ago, 75 years ago. It's the technology that's changed. The way you deliver the message may be different, but uh, the way you have to communicate with people is the same as it was 50 or 75 years ago. Yeah, and I know uh, for me, communication, you know, my background's in journalism, storytelling. And that's what really, you know, gets to the heart of, uh, you know, what people can get their teeth into, what they can, you know, wrap their heads around, right? Are you, mm-hmm. are you kind of a firm believer in the storytelling model? Very too? much so. Uh, a story can be much more effective than a bunch of, uh, a bunch of statistics, a bunch of facts. Uh, um, my old boss, Jim Doyle, used to say, facts tell, but stories sell. And it's, uh, it's stories that really get the job done. Exactly. Um, and then, yeah, I guess one story that we can tell is uh, 
earlier this summer, we were at the iHeartRadio uh, event um, where they had a panel discussion. They were talking about how to align brands with podcasting, which is, um, I did a previous podcast talking about how to podcast your brand. Mm -hmm. um, what were your thoughts on that? Did you, you know? It, it's, a, it's a very interesting business. Uh, the company I work for, iHeartMedia, is actually the biggest podcaster in America now and, uh, and, and very much believes in the medium. Uh, and, and that's where things get interesting because if you go back to the 90s when I first got into radio, if you wanted to listen to something, radio was the only option. And it was over the air and, uh, and you either listened to it or you, you went and you did something else. And now in addition to terrestrial radio, the regular radio you get in your car, there is streaming audio that's coming in through people's cell phones and Alexa devices and Apple watches and computers and laptops. Uh, there is uh, satellite radio, uh, and there's podcasting. And podcasting is really, in my mind, it's a form of radio. It's something that people sit down and listen to, and you have the ability, if you're a podcast sponsor, to, uh, to tell a story in there about your business and how it can help people. Uh, but, it, but the principles of that are, are the same as they were in radio advertising 50 years ago. It's what's the story you need to tell, who do you need to tell it to, and what's the best way of convincing people to take an action. That's great. Yeah, that's huge. Um, yeah, because it's, and then it's like, it's a longer form. It's a, yeah another kind of spinoff where I don't know. Uh, some might say it's harder because you have more flexibility and more freedom. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes limitations of a radio. You only have a segment. It forces you to get the best bits in there, mm -hmm. uh, things that are going to catch people's attention. Whereas now you have a podcast. The you know, three hours for a podcast isn't out of the normal. Not at all. Not at all. And. Uh, and people's expectations of advertising are different. You know, if you were listening to the radio or you're watching television, part of the deal has always been you get the programming for a while and then the commercials show up and you might have three or four or five commercials in a row and then back to the programming. Podcasting people are not as willing to accept long advertising stretches. So we have to present it differently and do it differently uh, because if people have to wait too long to get back to what they're doing, they won't stick around. And we want to make sure they stick around. Exactly. And I've heard some really interesting ones, like almost these custom advertisements within a show, mm -hmm. um, which is so much different than what you would have seen on television, where it's like, it's kind of this blanket approach. You don't know who's going to be watching. So you're making something that's you know going to resonate with like 90% of people. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a podcast, you know exactly who your target audience is going to be. You know them a lot more intimately. And uh, sometimes you hear the speaker or the, you know, the host of the show will talk about their experience with the product. And you're like, well, I already listened to this person. They're a, you know, a thought leader in their industry. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, if they enjoy the product, then you know, I'm going to Absolutely. Like if, if, if I like this host, if I trust this host, and this host is using a product that I'm interested in, I'm more willing to give it a try. There's, there's built-in credibility to that, and that helps. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. So uh, I, I don't think we have figured out exactly everything about where podcasting fits into it. But it's another place people are going and listening. It's uh, we we used to call ourselves radio. We call ourselves audio now because there's so many different ways for people to listen to uh, what they want to hear. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, kind of a little bit more broad, generalized. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to pick your brain about the history of all of this. You know, kind of just taking a big a big back step. Maybe when you first got into this, I mean, it was a lot more challenging to have access to the radio waves or not radio waves, but the podcast waves or all these different platforms. Like, if you wanted to do video, you needed really expensive equipment. You needed to be on, uh, you know, you had to pay for you know a space on television. Mm -hmm. Now you just you know get your phone, go on YouTube, and you're gonna you know have an audience to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to obviously build a community like yeah. anything. Absolutely. The uh, the, the equipment has gotten better and it's gotten cheaper and so the cost of entry is a lot less uh, it's, it's the kind of thing where um, you know if you go back a few years we're sitting right now in a coffee shop doing this and uh, and you would have had to find a studio somewhere rent a studio and pay for very expensive high-end equipment we can now get sound that is just as good as the best high-end equipment for a whole lot less which makes it easier to uh, to do a podcast doesn't mean that the podcast is going to be compelling or that anyone's going to want to listen to it. You still have to earn the attention, mm -hmm. but it's easier to get started. Exactly. Um, no, it's pretty exciting. Do you have uh, you know any you know thoughts on where things could go? And, and it's hard to gauge with anything, but mm -hmm. um, kind of the future of podcasting. You know, is it going to become you know right now it's generalized and you'll come back uh, into just only a few people having 
you know, the, a lot of the attention? Or well, I, I think there are always going to be big national podcasts, and and there are a, you know a bunch of big national podcasts right now. Ron Burgundy, uh, Fred Ferrara, um, you know, a, a lot of podcasts that are listened to by thousands and thousands of people. But uh, where the interesting thing is coming is local podcasts, where instead of uh, you know thousands of people nationwide, you might only have a few hundred people listening in Portland, Oregon. But those few hundred people could be very desirable to a business, and it could be cost effective to get on there and talk about it. So it's it's narrow casting, it's slicing the market into smaller pieces, and uh, and and figuring out advertising that's going to appeal to uh, to them. Um, how that's going to be sold in the local market, there are people much smarter than I am uh, working on that right now and figuring out the best way to do it. Um, but if you know, you know, right now with the, with radio, you can talk to hundreds of thousands of people at once. Uh, to do that on podcasting requires combining podcasting into a network, and uh, and that's something that's still uh, you know it's ongoing. We're working on that. Yeah, that's awesome. No, the. <laughs> yeah, you kind of brought up a couple different things and a lot of you know different ways things could go, and you know, I, I think niching down has always been you know, a benefit in any organ, you know, for any product or for any uh, company out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you've been doing this since '95. I just kind of want to let's go back into like uh, you know Phil Phil Bernstein kind of getting started. What, what were things like when you first were getting into uh, this industry? I, I was a I was a radio listener as a kid. Uh, when I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, I wanted to be Mason Lee Dixon, who was a local guy on KXOK Radio, and uh, and I wound up on the air as a news announcer in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, I noticed as I went to work every day that the salespeople were driving nicer cars than I was. And so I started asking, what do the salespeople do, and how do they do it? And wound up crossing over to that side of the business so I can stay in you know, stay in the business and uh, have a little bit more control over my, uh, you know, my income and my career. And uh, so in 1995, I got a job with KEX Radio in Portland, which is the big news and talk station. Stayed with that company uh, you know, as, as it grew bigger. Um, I went from one station to three stations to ultimately eight stations in, uh, in Portland. Um, did that until 2010, and then got a job with a national advertising consulting company called Jim Doyle & Associates. That's when I started getting on planes every week, and instead of just working with Portland businesses, you know, I'd, I'd fly into Denver and spend a week with a TV station meeting with their customers, or Orlando, or San Diego, or Jonesboro, Arkansas, or Amarillo, Texas, and uh, and you know, every uh, every couple of weeks it was a new market, and I found that there were differences. You know, that the big market people and small market people needed the same thing. You know, uh, you know, a small market, a car buyer in Jonesboro, Arkansas is just like a car, a car buyer in Washington, D.C. You know, do you have the truck I want? Do you have more than one for me to look at? Am I going to get a good deal on it? You know, anything that's going to work in a small market will work in a big market because ultimately people are going to be the same for things like that. Yeah, they have the same need, right? The, the same need, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome, and that's I think that's reassuring for a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, especially from a marketing approach. You're like, oh, yeah, there could be little nuances, but mm -hmm. it's nice to know that there is uh, some things that you can translate over. Mm -hmm. um, which I think, uh, you know, kind of piggybacking. Are you are you okay with getting into the book a little bit? Talking sure. about the ebook. Okay, Absolutely. so uh, we have I have your ebook in front of me. Um, actually, this is a, not the e-version. This is the the more printed version. Thank you for bringing a copy. Sure. But the the seven deadly advertising mistakes and how to fix them. Um, do you have a favorite of the seven? Yeah, they're, they're all you know they're all precious and uh, and I run into them often. And the interesting thing is is I originally made this list um, probably in about 2000. And uh, and some of the stories are different now, but the list is still the same. The mistakes people were making then are the, are the same mistakes now. And uh, and and probably the biggest one is doing advertising where you don't tell people what to do, um, what the uh, what the action step is. You know, when when I start working on a campaign, the first thing I ask the advertiser is, when they hear your message, when they see your message, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to walk into your store? 
Do you want them to go to your website? Do you want them to download some information? Uh, do you want them to call you on the phone? What's the action step that, uh, that you want them to take? I find a lot of people haven't thought about it. It's like, well, let me tell you about the business and then you'll figure out what to do next. People don't want to figure it out. They want it, you know, they want it spelled out for them. So the first question to always ask when you're working on a campaign is, if somebody hears it and they like what they hear, what do you want them to do next? And then make sure that that information is in the ad so there is no question what the next step is. That's awesome. And I think that translates to a lot of things in, uh, you know, in life as well. You, know, mm -hmm. you don't want to ask some, someone too many things mm -hmm. or else they get overwhelmed. I, yeah. you know, I've seen business cards where people put uh, three different phone numbers on there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple different emails, yeah. an address, all this other stuff. And yeah, I think keeping that simple and just having people go to one spot mm -hmm. uh, can really do wonders. Absolutely. And, and one of the things I talk about in the, uh, in the e-book is to limit the number of choices you give people. It's better to give them one action to take than it is to give them a list of five. And, and I hear that in advertising all the time. You know, if you're interested, like us on Facebook, or go to our website, or stop by our store, or call us on the phone. And now people have to make a decision. Which one of these things do I want to do? And if people have to stop and make a decision, a lot of times the decision they make is not to do anything at all. So it's, you, I've found and I experimented with this and I've learned that a single call to action is going to work much better than giving people a bunch of choices. Exactly. And then uh, just for the people listening, I, I'm going to put a link in the description to the book so people can go uh, check it out and they can mm -hmm. uh, you know, download and uh, you know, get immersed and get in the, into the head of Phil Bernstein. Mm -hmm. um, Anything else you think we should probably uh, dive into within the book? I think that's great. Not overwhelming people. Um, one of the other ones is uh, you know the so what test. The so what test. Yeah, yeah you want to talk about that one? The, the so what test is when you are advertising, it doesn't matter where. It could be television, it could be radio, it could be digital, it could be newspaper. Whatever you're using, imagine your target customer sitting back and you've just made a claim. And they say, so what? Why do I care? And if you cannot answer the so what question in a way that matters to them, don't put it in the ad. And I, you know, and I hear this all the time. Well, we've been in business since 1960. Well, that's great. So what? Why do I care? You know, I need something today. I need something in 2019 or 2020. So what? You know, we just won a, you know, a big national award. So what? Why do I care about your award? I care about me. I care about the, uh, the problems I'm having and how your product or service is going to solve my problem. Anything that's not about me or my problem, I don't care. Not interested. And so that's a big one is, is, you know, have somebody look at what you just wrote and say, so what? Why does it matter? Um, and, and that's going to, uh, that's going to help you tremendously in narrowing the message down to what counts. I think that's great. Yeah, uh, I think it, what it comes to mind for me right away is like you think of these technology companies and mm -hmm. they get so excited about the features, you know, that mm -hmm. has, you know, X, about, X amount of RAM and gigabytes and, mm -hmm. you know, whirly gigs. And like at the end of the day, yeah, so what? Uh, you know, speak the language of the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of, you know, yeah. not, not to give a nod to Apple, but I think they kind of simplified that for in, people. In a lot of ways they did. And, and in many cases, you know, the products that Apple sells, they didn't invent the category. They, they didn't invent the phone, you know, the, the cellular phone. They just made it do things that other phones didn't do after they watched some of the complaints people had. Um, and, and so that's a lot of it is what, you know, what problems are out there that we can help you solve uh, to yeah. invent it. Talking about technology, you know, whether you love Uber or you hate Uber, Uber solved a problem for a lot of people, which is, God, I hate calling the cab companies. And, uh, you know, they don't answer the phone. They don't send the cab out. I don't know where they are. I don't know when they're coming. I've got to pull out cash and pay them that way. Or I have to pull out a credit card and watch the guy, you know, swipe it. And, and what Uber did was made the whole process much easier for people. You pull out your phone, you tap an app, and, uh, and the car shows up. And, uh, and that disrupted an industry because that industry had some real problems. And, uh, and, and what Uber did and Lyft behind it was solve some of those problems and, uh, and charge admission for it. Totally. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild. And, uh, you know, on the, on the same front, they created jobs out of it and, you know, it has all these other, you know, ripple effects of what they've done. But um, 
Yeah, at the end of the day, that's what, you know, the bigger the problem you solve, mm -hmm. uh, usually, you know, the bigger paycheck you get or the, you know, the more clients you're going to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I guess, uh, you know, when you sit down with some of these companies and you start doing an analysis and assessment, do they know what their exact problem they solve for their clients are? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And, uh, and, and it, you know, there are some people who have thought about it and they know exactly who their target is, why that person's interested, and, uh, and what they can do for them, and others really haven't given much thought. And so I've got to drill down, and, and uh, I had somebody uh, compliment me, it was a compliment on the interrogation that I give them. And interrogation is usually not a positive word, but he meant it as, you're the first person ever to ask me about this stuff. Mm. And, uh, and, and so a lot of it is trying to figure out, you know, who has this problem? And a question I ask all the time is, what is going on in somebody's world that makes them decide that now they want to do business with you? What happened in their life that made them decide, you know, I need to make a change and I'm willing to pay somebody to help me change it? And, uh, and coming up with that really allows you to focus in on the, uh, on the message. Interesting. So, yeah, you call it an interrogation, but that's kind of your, your consultation. You're asking them in mm -hmm. analysis some questions around yeah. it. Well, that's a that's a great idea. What was the turning point that made them decide that I, this is too painful? I need to bring someone on board to be able to help me alleviate this pain. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, d drilling in on that, you're actually probably able to get a better outcome. Yeah. With whoever it is that you're working with. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and and some of it is, if you're a window dealer, uh, everybody who owns a home has windows right now. And most people are either happy with the windows they have or they are not so unhappy they're ready to do something about it. And something has to happen in their life. You know, one day they're sitting and watching television and there's this terrible draft behind them or, uh, you know, or, or there's noise coming in outside or, you know, or they got their energy bill and realized that their, you know, their heating is going out. You know, they're trying to heat the, uh, the backyard and something makes them decide now instead of buying a new car, I want windows. And so trying to figure out what that problem is allows you to focus in on why your windows are going to be the best one. And that's true of any product that you're uh, That's you're awesome. Um, do you have any resources or tools that you, th you would recommend to somebody to be able to figure that out? Or is it just a matter of taking down, sitting down with a piece of paper and a pen and you know, really you know, dialing in what you think it is that you do for your client? Um, I, you, usually it's, it's making a list of, of questions. Uh, and, and there are some good books on, uh, on the subject that you can look at. I'll recommend a couple of books that are worth uh, any marketer's time to read. One of them is uh, is by a guy called named Bill Schley, and that's S C H L E Y. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Johnny Can't Brand. Uh, came out probably in 2005. It's not a long book, but it's a very smart book. And uh, and and one I would definitely recommend. Another one is by a guy named Tom Ray, R A Y. And he wrote a book called Branding is Out, Results are In, Lessons for the Local Advertiser. And those are two really good books to really focus in on what are you trying to say and what's the best way to, uh, to tell that story. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think the, the listeners are going to really enjoy those. So you guys check, the, check those out. We'll put those in the, in the description as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, you can give people a kind of an overview of uh, why Johnny can't brand. And um, I know a lot of organizations... I've picked up the book. I'm so sorry to say I haven't flipped through the entire thing yet. Mm -hmm. I think I've read a chapter or two. Um, but I know whole organizations have been like revolutionized because of that book. Or at least yeah. it gets people in the mindset of the marketers and understanding, okay, this is what these guys are trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, kind of get some brand alignment. I'll, I'll mention what to me is the most important concept in that book. And there are, there's a lot of good stuff. But there's something that uh, Bill Schleich called the positioning paradox. And what he said is the narrower you focus your message, the wider that message goes. And what he means is the more you try to tell people, the more detail you give people, the less they're going to remember. He says, focus your message on one single thing. And if that one single thing gets people to pick up the phone and call you or walk into the store or go to your website, you can tell the rest of the story once they get there. Just give them enough information to, uh, to take action. Um, and best example, if you think about McDonald's, and you know, whether you love McDonald's as a restaurant or hate McDonald's as a restaurant, as a marketing company, they are probably the best in the business. I mean, they have figured out exactly how to get people to get up off the couch, get in the car, and drive past Wendy's and Burger King and Taco Bell and walk into their stores and do it. And there's a lot on McDonald's menu. 
I mean, there's Big Macs, Egg McMuffins, Quarter Pounders, Chicken McNuggets, Happy Meals, coffee. But when you see a McDonald's ad on TV, they don't put it all in there. There's not an ad that says we got Big Macs and Egg McMuffins and Quarter Pounders and Chicken McNuggets and Happy Meals. Come and see everything we have. It's 30 seconds about the Big Mac or it's 30 seconds about the Happy Meal or the McRib. Just enough to get people in the door. Once they're in the door, they look up at the menu and they'll see everything else. And if that works for McDonald's and McDonald's measures everything, it'll work for your business. You just got to figure out what to focus on. Yeah. And... Um... I guess for those guys, yeah, they focused, uh, you, you mentioned like one product, I know that, you know, st sticking to a slogan or mm -hmm. maybe kind of a, a look and feel. Um, yeah, so whenever you are going to market, whenever you're doing a campaign, keeping it, you know, simplified to just uh, that one one key topic and then mm -hmm. driving that home, how long do you think you would run something like that, you know, a co couple months or? As long as it works. As long as it works, As long, yeah. long as it works. Um, That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, let your customers tell you. Uh, and, and here's a story for you about that. And it's a, it's a story that Tom Ray introduced me to. Tom and I used to work together. And, um, and, and it'll show you how long an ad can work if you do it. He met at one point with a furniture store owner in Merrill, Wisconsin, which is outside Wausau, Wisconsin a place called Courtside Furniture, and he took a tour of the store with the owner, a guy named Tony Cussero, and, uh, and Tony was showing him around the store, and they were in the recliner section, and Tom said, wow, you got a lot of recliners here, how many do you have? And he said, you know, right, <coughs> right now I'm a little heavy, I've probably got 100 out here, but I always have at least 80 recliners on the floor. And Tom said, you sell a lot of recliners? He said, oh, yeah, that's what everyone comes in and, and looks for first. And Tom came back and said, what I want you to do is stop with the laundry list advertising. I want you to do 30 seconds about nothing but recliners and talk about how you have 80 on the floor. And Tony went with it. And he, he did a commercial. He's in Wisconsin, so he was wearing a Packers jersey with the number 80 on it. And, uh, and he said, you need a recliner? Come to Courtside Furniture. We've always, always got 80 on the floor to choose from. And he ran that ad, one ad that he recorded on the same TV station in the same programs for five straight years. He didn't change it. Didn't, <coughs> didn't change it at all. And in a year three, I came in there and I met with Tony and I said to him, you ever think about changing the ad? And he said, oh yes. I am so sick to death of that ad. I think about changing it every time it comes on. And I said, well, why don't you? And he said, because every time it comes on, somebody comes in and buys furniture from me. <laughs> and he ran that ad for five years, and then he re-recorded a new version of it in a different jersey with a different price point, and he ran it for another two years because it worked. And so that's it. As long as people are responding, leave it alone. Yeah, why, why change, uh, why, why fix it if, it, if it's not broken, if it's not right? broken. So that's awesome. Um, that's cool. So you've, you've gotten to kind of brush uh, elbows with some of these people that are, you know, pretty mm -hmm. well established in the marketing industry. Yeah. Um, pretty nice people. Able, you know. Some of them. Some of them, yeah. yeah. Some <laughs> are, some are. Tom's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and everyone's, you know, it's interesting because everyone's got an opinion. There are a lot of marketing gurus out there. And our advice sometimes, you know, some, we contradict each other sometimes. We have different ways of going about it. And all I can tell people is, you know, if you think my advice might make sense, try it. See if it works. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't, kick me out and bring somebody else in. Yeah. And uh, luckily, it works often enough. I've been able, I've been able to make a living at this. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I like that you, know, you were just talking about kind of how candid you are with the with the clients. And I remember, you know, from that speech a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest things. You know, we have a family over here banging stuff on the on the tables, but uh, hopefully, um, in a speech a long time ago. You mentioned, um, and I, this has always stuck with me. When you're talking with a client, asking them, has anything changed since the last time you talked with them? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, with this podcast, we kind of talk about you know the marketing strategies, but then also the consultations, one on one. So when you were, uh, yeah, because I think you were talking about one client, you know, you had a great meeting with them, everything mm -hmm. went smoothly, yep. and then the next time you saw them, it was as if they uh, wanted nothing to do with you, right? Well, what it actually, if, if it's the story I'm thinking of, it was that his business model had completely changed. 
A big thank you to our sponsors over at songtub.com. That's right, song or music and a tub, like a bath, but more fun to say. Tub, tub. Anyway, you can check out Songtub's website for any of your music needs. In fact, the song playing in the background right now is from Songtub. So why pick them over anyone else? Well, they curate the music. And I know the guys, so that means I know that they're selecting great music for your project. A lot of other companies will brag about how many songs they have, maybe 100,000, 200,000, maybe even a million. But honestly, I don't have time for that. I don't have the time to just sit down and go, next, 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 a song, not so great. You know, trying to figure out where the best music is. Songtub.com, great place to get your music. And now I'm excited to offer you the first month for free if you go to songtub.com slash pro, P-R-O, and we have a promo code for you. Yes, that's right. My name, your host, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, and that will give you your first month free to have access to a huge music library that you can use towards your next video project, podcast, or any of your general audio needs. Anyway, back to the show. Uh, I met a dentist in Billings, Montana, and we had a wonderful first meeting. He, uh, you know, he, he was interested, he was engaged, he answered all my questions, he laughed at all my jokes, not everyone does. And, uh, and, you know, and when it was done, I said, I've got some ideas for you, I'm gonna work on them, let's get together again in two weeks, and I'll share them. And he was all excited about the meeting, and I was all excited about the meeting. And in my mind, out of all the people I met with in Billings, this was going to be the slam dunk. This was the one where all I had to do was lay it out, wait for him to sign, and we'd be done. And I came back two weeks later, and he came in with his wife, and he sat down, and he wouldn't look at me. And I launched into my presentation. I started with where I was thinking of, and he didn't like anything I presented. He didn't like any of my ideas. He made fun of them. He, uh, he, thought they, he, said, uh, he, he said they were too simple. They wouldn't work. And when it was over, and I asked him what he wanted to do. He said, well, I'll think about it and I'll let you know. And he got up and he marched out. And I was absolutely stunned because this was the guy who loved me. And this was the guy who was going to take my advice and sign. And I could not figure out what had gone wrong. I was just baffled by it. And the next day, his wife, who had been in the meeting, called him, called the, the accounting executive for the TV station and apologized. And it turned out what had happened was that the day before our meeting, the dentist had met with his accountant, and it turned out that somebody had embezzled $100,000 from the practice. And that was the mood he was in when he came in to meet with me. He wasn't going to buy anything from anyone, and I just happened to show up on the day after he had found out he was $100,000 short of where he thought. And what I learned from that is that any time I start a presentation, the first question I ask is, has anything changed since the last time we got together? And every now and then it has. Man, uh, two things come to mind for me. I've heard a, an old old saying that, uh, what is it? Two out of four dentists, they're, uh, they've had um, their company uh, embezzled from, and then the two others are just uh, a matter of time before you know it happens to them. Well, so. I don't know if it's <laughs> if it's a dental industry or not. Yeah, it could but just be. Uh, um, embezzling does happen. I've run into another case of, of where, where a client got uh, yeah, had the same thing happen to uh, to them, but I knew about it before I presented. And and then do they uh, is marketing budget the first thing that goes typically for a lot of these guys? Very often, very and and that doesn't mean it should. But as you're looking at things, you still have to pay the light bill. You still have to pay your you know your staff. You, you still have to pay the rent on the building or the mortgage. Marketing, optional. And it can very often be the first thing that's cut, and, and that's not necessarily a smart move, because if you stop talking to people about who you are and why they should do business with you, people forget. And, uh, <coughs> and obviously, I've got a dog in the fight. I don't want anyone to, can, to cut their marketing budget, but I do tell people, think about it before you do, because that's what brings money in. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Yeah, because you want to be top of mind for people, and if they don't know who to turn to, they're going to go to your competitors who mm -hmm. do have the budget, who are you know, you know, the, the old you know marketing adage that someone needs to see your your content seven times before they're going to do business with you, right? Mm -hmm. So, and even after they know you, um, that doesn't mean they'll still know you six months from now. And uh, and so it's if you're not consistent, you're non-existent. It's Michael Hyatt. I stole that from Michael Hyatt. But uh, but that's the key is to be out there. 
Um, McDonald's, going back to a McDonald's story, that's a company with 100% name recognition in the United States. We're in a, uh, a coffee shop right now. I could walk across the aisle, talk to the people at the next table, and ask them where McDonald's is. They'll know. I, they don't have to. Say, they're not going to say who's McDonald's. What are they? They know who McDonald's is. They know where McDonald's is. They know what McDonald's has on the menu. But when I go home tonight and and put on the television, I'm going to see a McDonald's ad because McDonald's doesn't want anyone to forget, and they know that they will. So once you get that mind share, you got to keep it, and that takes continuing investment. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the challenges, right? For a lot of people, is they want to be like. Uh, it's like anything. You want to get you know. You're going to the gym. You want to just go to the gym once and be fit and you're done. But mm -hmm. marketing is one of those things that constant, needs constant refresh. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of a, a good thing for people like us in the marketing field because it means that we have a job. But for sure. people that are business owners, um, mm -hmm. do you have any words to them? Like uh, how, to, how to kind of manage that? Uh, it can probably be exhausting. It, it can be. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, when people ask, well, how long is, is this going to take? The answer is forever. It just It's something you should be budgeting for every single month all year, every year, because you're going to need it. You're going to need to get out there and, and let people know what you have to, uh, to offer. Uh, nobody wants to spend money on advertising. Everybody, if they could cut their advertising budget tomorrow, they would, but they don't because they want what advertising brings, which is awareness and action and, uh, and a flow of new customers. Exactly. Which fills their pockets. Which, which fills, and, and money. <laughs> it brings money. Yeah. Done, done properly. That's awesome. Well, let's see. What else do we got here on the on the agenda? Phil, you're doing great. I really Thank you. You know, really appreciate having you on here. Um, yeah, we, maybe. Uh, I guess this is a nice kind of piggyback on uh, what we've been talking about. But like cutting through the advertising noise, because mm -hmm. um, now uh, uh, even we talked about this earlier that the channels are so much more accessible. Mm -hmm. So how do you you know stand out? Is it storytelling? Is it the brightest colors? It's, you know, it, it's different in, in every case. Uh, it is much harder to make advertising work than it used to be because there are so many choices. Uh, there are people, and I am among them, who can remember a day when there were only three TV stations. There was ABC, there was NBC, and there was CBS. And if you didn't want to watch one of those, you didn't watch TV. And what that meant was that when an ad came on, they had a third of the market. They had 33% of the market already and a lot of people and nobody had a cell phone to look down at and play with. So they had to pay attention. And so it was easier in 1968 for an advertising campaign to work because it was very much a captive audience. Now everybody's got a choice. If you don't catch them in the first few seconds, they're looking at their phone again. And, uh, and there's always another, another shiny object to look at and that means the campaign's got to be better written than it used to be, better directed than it used to be, and more frequent than it used to be, because it takes more repetition to get through all the noise that people are, uh, are dealing with. Exactly. Have you, um, I know you, you're kind of more with the traditional, have you dabbled with uh, phone advertisements or anything of that yeah, nature? My, my company has a complete digital advertising department, so yes, we, uh, uh, we, we do uh, mobile advertising quite a bit. We do podcast advertising. We do streaming audio. Um, a lot of you know email campaigns. Yeah. So in terms of digital advertising, we have a lot of the tools that you can find out there in the in the big digital agencies. Yeah. Uh, and and that is another area of advertising didn't exist ten years ago, but is uh, you know another way to bring a campaign together. Uh, Tom Ray, who wrote Branding Is Out, Results Are In, coined a term. I think he made the word up. Uh, and the word is tradigital. And tradigital advertising is a combination of traditional advertising, like radio or television or print, with digital advertising. And what the traditional advertising does is it shows up in front of people who aren't thinking about you right now. An ad for a window dealer shows up on your, on, you know, on your radio. You may not be thinking about uh, windows right now, but it gets into your head and it introduces you to that company. And then later, when you decide you want to buy Windows, you're going to go online and start poking around, and that's where the digital advertising comes in. And instead of going to Google and typing in Window Dealer Portland, Oregon, maybe you go to a specific website because you heard about that, uh, that advertiser on the radio. So the two work together pretty well. Uh, traditional advertising is top of the funnel, people who haven't started their research yet. Digital is people farther down who are, who are about to take action 
use them together. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Yeah, kind of building up that brand and name, kind of that namesake, name recognition. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now you nowadays we have the educated buyer, so they're going to go online and they're going to mm -hmm. research a little bit more about it. So I think that's great that you're talking about the different uh, aspects of the funnels. What is it, like tofu, mofu, all the different... Uh, <laughs> Not familiar with Not that. Not familiar with yeah. that. Yeah, tofu. Like top of funnel is like tofu. And, I don't know, whatever. Uh, now I gotta find that. Now I gotta, they, I gotta look that yeah, up online. But, but anyway, for kind of explaining, for people that don't know what the funnel is, um, you, you kind of have everyone at the surface level that you're just like you were saying is just giving them enough to to chew on, uh, maybe explaining what problem you solve, and then as you get further and further down, you're <laughs> you're maybe doing longer form education to explain to someone. Uh, what your product does, or maybe yeah. uh, case studies or examples, or really walking, you know, a whole webinar or slides. Absolutely, the, you know, the people at the top of the funnel, you know, are not may not be aware that they have a problem yet, or if they are, they may not be aware of you at all, and and so the message that you give somebody at the top of the funnel is different from the message you give somebody who's already looked at five websites and just needs to narrow down the choices. So where in the funnel somebody is is going to affect what your message is as well. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, okay, so cutting through the noise, uh, the marketing long game, I think that's great. We've talked about, you know, always putting that into your budget. Um, what, what is it? I, I'm sure you kind of know better than I would when it comes to, like, what percentage of, uh, you know, someone's, you know, budget. I think it used to be, like, 2%. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sure it may be up to, like, 20% of someone's, you know, total. But everyone, every situation is every, different. Every situation every is, different. is different. And, uh, and it depends on what you have and, and where you are. Uh, Roy Williams, the Wizard of Ad, talks about figuring out how much of your advertising budget is in your location. If you're paying for a high, you know, a, a location that's high traffic, and people are going to be walking by all the time anyway, you need, you know, in that case, you may not have to spend as much on advertising. If your business is out of the way and and they and they don't know you exist, you're going to have to have a higher percentage going into advertising to to attract people in there. Um, you know, the percentage is going to vary depending on, on a lot of different factors, uh, but, you know, but the key is enough, you know, the more money you spend to a point, the more money you can make, and as long as you were spending less than you're bringing in, it makes sense to, uh, to increase it. Yeah, I think that's great. And yeah, every, every situation is, you know, totally unique. Um, how early in someone's you know business uh, you know cycle should someone bring in a consultant and start helping them with the marketing process? Would you would you imagine? I would say early. Yeah. Um, you know, before you start making decisions, you know, talk to somebody who knows what they're doing, who has some experience in this. And uh, obviously, if, if you talk to me, I'd love to uh, love to be the person. But you want somebody who it isn't their first day doing this. And you know, people tend to think because they hear advertising, they're experts in it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not what your, uh, you know, your, your, your business partner likes. It's what's going to have the strongest effect on, uh, on your business. And so one of the things to keep in mind is that very often you are very different from your target customer. You know, you may be a 55-year-old man, but your target customer might be a 31-year-old woman. Two different people, two different needs. You want to figure out something, you know, it's not the radio station you like or the television programs you like, it's the radio station or television programs that she likes mm -hmm. and, and a message that appeals to her. So make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Bringing in an expert is not a bad idea. Yeah. No, I think that's huge. And I think that's great because not everyone can put themselves into the shoes of their, their customer. I mean, you obviously you build out profiles of who you'd want to you know, target and who, who's going to you know, buy your product. but. Mm -hmm. You know, doing surveys and uh, doing small group sessions to figure out what people's in, you know, what, what mm -hmm. actually aligns and doing A-B split testing. Like, those mm -hmm. are all big things that can, uh, you know, really go a long way that do, if you don't know what those things are, mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to be kind of throwing noodles against the wall hoping they stick, right? Uh, absolutely. You, you would not want, you know, if you were a uh, funeral director, you would not want me coming in and telling you how to embalm the bodies in, you know, in the same way. You don't want to tell an advertising expert how to do the advertising. You've got your expertise, you know your business. Talk to somebody who knows how to communicate that business to somebody else. I know. That's, that's the, the big challenge of this industry is that people, uh, I think, because they see so much marketing and advertising, they think mm -hmm. they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you run into that sometimes? I do. Yeah. I do. And, uh, and, and I have on occasion you know, written a strong piece of advertising copy 
and somebody comes back and says, we got to change it because my business partner doesn't like it. And now I got to figure out, well, what do we do about that? Who's your business partner? What doesn't he like? And, you know, is there a valid objection here? And there are valid objections. You know, occasionally there's a legal issue, uh, you know, or, or a compliance issue, or, you know, a factor that I might not have considered when I, when I wrote the original copy. But in general, you want something that's going to stand out, and you want a professional uh, writing it to, uh, to make that happen. Yeah, so when that happens, um, it probably puts you in a tricky spot because you're trying to you know, ple please everyone, but if mm -hmm. you uh, send the advertisement out there and it doesn't perform well, mm -hmm. they can go back and say, oh, well, maybe it was your, your copy, but you're like, well, I changed it to meet what you guys wanted. So, mm -hmm. so who does it come, it come, it come? I mean, you have to take responsibility for it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and one thing I say to advertisers on occasion is, uh, Mr. and Ms. Advertiser, if you want to do it this way, I have two responsibilities. One responsibility is to my company, which is to take your money if you want to give it to me. But the other responsibility I have to, is to you, and that is to tell you when I don't think it's going to work. And I don't think it's going to work. If you still want to do it, we'll do it. But I want to be on record as saying, I don't think it's going to get you the results you want. And most people, when they hear that, go, all right, let's go back and take another look at it. And on occasion, somebody says, well, I'm going to do it that way. I take their money. Yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting because they, they're hiring an expert. They're hiring someone that has, you know, has seen a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so why are they bringing you on if they don't even want to you know, listen mm -hmm. to what you have to say? So, yeah. Interesting. That's part of, part of sales as well, is trying to balance all those, all those issues. Yeah. Have you ever, I mean, it sounds like uh, you've worked with people that have a couple part, or, you know, maybe it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to, you know, please a lot of different cooks in, in the kitchen? <laughs> yep, and sometimes they don't all agree. Yeah. And I'm dealing with one right now with uh, with four different people in two different companies who've gotten together, and they don't. I thought they agreed on what they wanted to do until we actually put it on paper. And now I'm trying to figure out whether we can get something that everyone can live with. Uh, the more voices there are, the more chances of disagreement there are, and and that is complicated. Yeah. Do you try to find um, kind of a middle ground between everyone? Do you think there's always a way to, you know, sometimes, appease everyone? Sometimes there is. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you look at it and you go, this, you know, there's just no way of making this work. Yeah. Um, somebody has to decide on one way or the other. And, you know, one of the nice things about the position I'm in is that I've been doing this long enough. I've got enough business to work with that I don't need any one particular advertiser. If, if they walk away, they walk away. I've got other people to talk to, other people to work with. Um, so I'm not, you know, early in my career, I took any business I could get and wrote it any way somebody wanted to write it because I needed, you know, I needed money on the books. I have the luxury now of being able to pick and choose a little bit, and that's a nice position to be in. Yeah, and that just comes with time and experience and, mm -hmm. you know. And success. Being around the block, yeah, and yeah. having the success. No, I think that's great. Hopefully you don't have that, too many more situations like that. People can just say, hey, I hired you, uh, you know, let's make this work and you know, let's get a successful outcome. So um, this topic I'm really excited about, marketing meets sales. Mm -hmm. Did you see that in, in the topic list? I did, list? yeah. Um, and I've been in organizations where they don't speak to each other and it's kind of, uh, or you have marketing moving along and then there's no one on the sales team to pick it up mm -hmm. uh, because there's no salespeople uh, within the organization because they weren't big enough to have salespeople yet. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts there? Uh, you know, do you, do you ever find sales teams over uh, encroaching and trying to give, uh, you know, advertising direction and then maybe on the other side of things, marketers trying to tell salespeople how to do their job? Yeah, there, there's, there's a certain amount of conflict there that, uh, that happens and you have to navigate that. Um, but one of the important things is to make sure that if marketing does its job, which is to deliver leads to the salespeople, the salespeople are in a position to convert those leads into money. And, uh, and it, it becomes a matter of looking at ways that something can go wrong. And one of the things I have learned to do is uh, you know, when somebody gives me, you know, when I ask what the action is, if the action is go to a website, I go and look at that website. And I go, if somebody hears my message and goes to that website, do they know what to do next? You know, can they find the information they need? Can they then contact sales and, and buy something? And often, too often, I find that those things aren't there. That, uh, that, that there is no path 
from the marketing to making a sale. And so I've got to look at that website and say, you know, the problem is if we do something and everybody goes to your website, they're going to leave because there's nowhere to go next. And so I push people to, you know, to change the website. If somebody has a phone number on the ad, I actually dial the number, see if anyone picks up. Because if nobody picks up, or if it goes to a weird phone tree or something like that, that's where it's going to fall apart. So I test all those things. And I've had to call people back and say, you know what, I just called your switchboard and I can't get through. If your ad starts tomorrow and somebody calls that switchboard and they can't get through, they're not going to call back. They're going to call your competitor. And so we've got to fix that before the ad starts. Yeah, a, little, a lot of waste of money there, mm -hmm. actually. So you kind of go through every single little process, every every step of the way, which mm -hmm. uh, maybe business owners are so in you know the weeds of whatever they're doing that mm -hmm. they don't think about every step uh, chronologically like that. Yeah, it's it's funny how many business owners haven't looked at their website in two or three years. You know, they looked at it the day it was put up, and then they never go back to it. And so I go back and I look, and there's outdated information. You know, the About Us page, it turns out that they moved two years ago and the old address is still on there. Um, those are things somebody's got to look at, somebody's got to check, and sometimes I'm the first person who's looked in a while. Yeah. And uh, not great, but part of the, uh, you know, part of it as well. Yeah. Testing links and everything like Test, that. Testing so. links, all those things. <laughs> things break over time, so mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, yeah, any tips there? You think you think uh, maybe people should analyze uh, their processes, you know, every you know quarter. Say, hey, is everything functioning how it should mm -hmm. in the in the sales process? I, I think I think that's part of it, and and part of it is just making sure that you know that everyone's working together. That uh, it, you know, if you advertise a product and somebody goes to the store looking for the product, the people you know at, at the front desk ought to know where that product is. There ought to be sufficient. Uh, product in stock, marked at the price that you advertised. Somebody's got to check all that stuff. And, uh, and the fact that everything looked good a month ago doesn't mean it looks good today. So somebody's got to keep going back and, and checking because those are areas that uh, you know, can turn advertising from a revenue source into an expense. And you want it to be a revenue source. Yeah. Uh, in, your, in your book, you talk about the, um, the last mile. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain what the last mile is to, to people that are listening? The last mile is, uh, is where too many campaigns fall apart. And, and that's what we were just talking about. Um, you know, the, the ad comes on, there's a phone number to call, and nobody answers the phone, or nobody responds, or, or uh, you, know, you put in a web inquiry and it takes three days for somebody to get back to you, or, uh, you know, or the links are broken or something like that. The last mile is, you know, is, is from the shipping business where something you know, it starts out in a warehouse in Omaha, Nebraska, and needs to be delivered to a door in Portland, Oregon, and somehow it winds up stuck in the post office, or they can't find the address or something else. Advertising has a last mile, and the last mile is you know, the action somebody needs to take in order to, uh, to transfer money from their pocket to your pocket. Yeah, so really, yeah, dialing those processes even more. That's why I brought it up. Just I, I thought it kind of aligned with what we were talking about. Have you found, um, you know, and I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but uh, have you found, you know, when when profits aren't, you know, when when companies aren't seeing the revenue that they'd like to see, mm -hmm. um, fingers start getting pointed, do, and people sometimes point at marketing, mm -hmm. and then sometimes marketing points at sales, and then sales parts points at marketing. Uh, what are your thoughts there? <sighs> It happens. Yeah. You know, it's you know from my days when I used to have little kids. Do I have to stop the car? Uh, because uh, there is a certain amount of finger pointing, and a lot of times both sides are right. You know that, that they didn't talk to each other, and there's enough blame to go around. But what you, you know what you want to do is not find out who to blame. You want to fix the problem. So who has to fix it? If the, if there's a problem with the website, whose job is that? You know, who, who is it who, you know, who has responsibility for that? How do we get to that person and, uh, and get the changes made? So I'm not, looking to blame, you know, I'm not looking to play the blame game because ultimately somebody's going to point at me. And uh, I don't want them to point at me. So I want to make sure people are talking to each other and communicating the way they need to communicate. Yeah, I think that's great. So that way everyone can find a successful outcome, you mm -hmm. know. So, all right, uh, we're at about 50 minutes. Uh, let's take a little break. Um, okay. I have a little sponsorship ad. Uh, this is a new thing. Uh, feel free to listen, and uh, yeah, we'll be back in a second. A cactus knows how to survive. It can endure scorching heat, limited rainfall, and defends itself against critters 
daily. Your business is no different. To survive harsh conditions, it's important to develop deep roots using media content that'll continuously nourish and support your marketing efforts day after day. Tactus Media is here to help you determine a strategy and create media content. Together, let's map out the next sequence of videos, podcasts, and social media to help your business thrive. Work with Tactus Media, media tactics that stick. Ouch! Visit tactusmedia.com to learn more. Okay, we're back from the break. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phil just told me that he w- he's been up since five fifteen this morning, mm-hmm. three thirty this morning. Yep. You know, and uh, doing doing running around. So if uh, you hear a thump, it's my head hitting the table. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Oh man. Um, all right. So uh, I guess jumping back into things, um, the power of the follow up, and I've heard that. Um, it's a lot easier to keep a client than it is to get new clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that kind of goes in a similar vein, but yeah, the power of the follow-up that you write in your in your book. Um, I'm going to redo that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So just jumping right back into the, into the book, Phil, the power of the follow-up. Um, are a lot of people not doing that right now? There, there is a, a certain amount of that, and one of the things you want to make sure of is that if you've got somebody who has taken the time to research you, to make contact with you, and has voted with their wallet to do business with you, that person is a terrific lead for more business. Um, it's, and it's easier to convert that person into an, a continuing customer than it is to try to convince somebody who has no interest in you to become interested in you. So figuring out how to stay in touch with those people is a uh, you know is a big part of what you want to do. It's not just in most cases a single transaction. It's you know what's the lifetime value of your customer? How often can somebody come back? And uh, and how do you stay in touch with them? I have you know if you if you download my ebook, I ask for your name and, e- and uh, email address because I have a, a newsletter that goes out every couple of weeks uh, that allows me to stay in touch with uh, with people. And that's something that you want. You know, get their contact information. Make sure you're in touch with them one way or another in a way that uh, that they are most comfortable with. Exactly. Yeah, and, and then following, you get those extra touch points. And so you you, mm-hmm. you talked about email marketing. That's a, that's a huge you know way to stay be top of mind for people. And they're mm-hmm. going to check it and they're going to swipe it out or you know knock on wood that they don't unsubscribe. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's a and, and that's you know uh, following up digitally. And then there's also following up. Uh, with customers I've already done business with yeah. you. It's so. phone calls, you know, mm-hmm. it's checking in. You know, if, if somebody buys something from you, you can call them a few days later and find out how it worked, if, you know, what, what, they, uh, what their experience was. Uh, but you want to get that dialogue going so that people don't forget you in the, uh, in the meantime. Uh, yeah, and, and loyalty isn't something that you just get, it's something you have to earn. Mm-hmm. Have you found that people like to be a part of the, you know, the direction or the conversation of, of an organization, you know, bringing the customers in, into making some of those decisions about the direction of a, a marketing campaign or things of that nature? Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it depends on how big a, uh, how big a purchase is, it, how big a purchase it, it actually is. People are much more invested in something that's going to cost them thousands of dollars than they are in you know, buying milk at the store. And, and it's a different conversation then. You know, you, you, you know when, you go to, when you go to Fred Meyer for milk, you're not looking for a relationship, you're looking for milk. And, uh, and so that's the important part as well. What, what is it, um, and, and I hear sometimes that you know, what, you're, what you're looking for is for people to interact with your brand. Well, nobody got up this morning and said, you know what I want to do today? I want to interact with a brand. Uh, it's not about that. It's about what do they need, what problems are they trying to solve. Um, but you, but the interaction with the brand is just communication and making sure you stay in front of people. Yeah, except for the people who want to, uh, you know, go after the celebrities and give them a hard time. Uh, there is <laughs> that. Yeah, there are. There <laughs> they are wake trolls. up. They wake up every morning excited to do that. But yeah, I hear okay. you because uh, individual products. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. you're going through your day. What is your need? What problem is uh, that product going to solve for you? Is mm-hmm. really what they're, you know. I ran out of toothpaste. I need a new, you know. I need new toothpaste. New toothpaste. Yeah. So, no, I think that's great. Thank you, Phil. Um, one of your quotes that was in the book is, technology keeps changing, but the same mistakes keep happening. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we keep we keep seeing that as we move into the you know. Uh, yeah, we like to think that more software, more technology is going to solve the problems. Mm-hmm. But if the same mistakes keep happening, um, it, that's it, not really getting us anywhere. No, it, it just, it's just a different, uh, different form of things. It, it used to be somebody left you a message on your answering machine and you didn't call them back. Now they make a web inquiry and you don't respond to the web inquiry. Different technology, same problem. You know, nothing's changed except the, uh, the tool that people are using. And a new tool isn't going to solve the problem if you know if, if the mindset isn't right. Yeah, and the processes aren't built out. I know a lot of people are trying to solve their problems with automation too. You see it on the on the other side of things where it's not very human interaction. It's very mm-hmm. robotic, uh, transactional, and I don't know if that really resonates with people as well. I know, you know, just on the on the micro level of on. Uh, Instagram, you follow somebody and you get this pop-up that says, thanks for following me, and they just you know, blast you with all these things, and mm-hmm. kind of like we were talking about earlier, they send you, here's my website, here's like my channel, here's my this, and it gets overwhelming for you know where you're trying to send someone, and also it doesn't feel like a, a, a you know, very custom, personal approach to you. And, and automation has its place, uh, because everyone is running you know, a lean business right now, and you may not have the personnel to be able to do every touch point there. So there are things that can be it can be automated. I'm a big believer when somebody makes an inquiry uh, you know, after hours that there should be something automated that immediately gets back to them. Sometimes I you know I, I sign up for something. I you know I, I subscribe to a newsletter or I sign up for somebody's mailing list or I send in an inquiry and then nothing happens. And I don't know when I hit submit whether they got it or they didn't get it, and I don't know what's going to happen next. Automation that allows somebody at 3 in the morning to immediately shoot me an email and just said, we got your inquiry, we're going to get back to you, you know, between 9 and 5 tomorrow morning. That's better than nothing at all. And, uh, and it, it, so I, I think there's definitely a place for it, but I think you're right. People don't want to be inundated with, uh, with things. There's a balance you have to, have to definitely strike. Yeah, I think that's great. And... Um yeah, that's one of the nice things is being able to have something work on the back end while you're while you're uh, you know at 3 a.m. because not mm-hmm. not everyone's gonna be working around the clock. Some people try, but mm-hmm. um, well, we just have a few more questions here. Um, do you have any tips or advice for people in the industry? You know, someone that uh, is, I guess. Yeah, well, we'll do your tips and advice for someone that's just now starting out in the industry, you know, so other marketers, mm-hmm. and then, um, you know, I'll, I'll get to the next question after that. Okay. Uh, the, the main thing to know is that everything is changing. You know, that, that whatever you learn this month about the tools that are out there for marketing is going to be obsolete a year from now. So it's, it's more a matter of learn whatever you can and continue learning. Don't just, uh, don't just stop because there's always something new coming down the pike and another way to do it. But as you're learning things, don't just learn the technical specs, ask what it does. If somebody is gonna gonna buy advertising on on this channel, who's gonna see it and why is it important to me to to do? Um, And and that I think is is more important than anything else. It's It's not about the hammer, it's not about the drill, it's about making the hole. Mm-hmm. And uh, where's the hole going to be, and is it the right size, and, and how's it going to how's it going to affect me? Yeah, so I'm guessing yeah the problems are always going to be the same, mm-hmm. but the way that you go about solving that problem is going to it can change change drastically depending on you know mm-hmm. what what where technology takes us next. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which I don't know if we can really even predict it for it. Did you nope. ever see a, a phone a computer being in your pocket? You know when you were growing up as a kid? No, <laughs> no. I mean, you know, I can remember when a calculator cost a hundred dollars. Yeah. For just a calculator, and uh, now nobody has a calculator because it's on it's on the phone. It's it's all different, um, but but in the end, people are still the same. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a matter of staying on top of what the tools are and uh, and and how it's going to uh, you know how it's going to work. I think that's great. And then uh, the second question is tips to tips and advice for um, you know business owners. Uh, people that are looking to start getting into uh, using marketing services, where should they start? It can be a little overwhelming. Uh, it, it can be overwhelming, and I think one of the things you want to do is talk to somebody who has got your best interest at heart. Uh, there, there's something in, in my business, and I'm in the sales business, called commission breath. 
and commission breadth is when somebody shows up and all they're interested in is they've got a budget to hit for this month and what they want to do is sell whatever product their sales manager told them to sell this month. Um, what you want to do is, is have somebody who takes the time to learn enough about your business to be able to bring back some good advice. Uh, and I think you know the important thing is when, when a meeting is over, did you get value? You know, do you feel that the person you're talking to knows enough about what you need to be able to come back with a credible, uh, you know, with a credible idea for you? And if you don't, find somebody else. And it may take two or three times. If you don't feel comfortable with somebody, and, and I say this as somebody who occasionally gets ghosted, um, if you don't feel comfortable with somebody, find somebody else you're, you're more comfortable with. Exactly. Yeah, because it's a relationship at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to just do one campaign, you're mm -hmm. not going to do one ad. It's yeah. going to be over the course of you know, many, many years, hopefully, if it's a good relationship, uh, and you keep finding success and they're able to adapt and continue to meet the needs that you have as a business mm -hmm. owner, right? Yeah. So. And, and the other thing I would say as a business owner is if you talk to somebody who tells you that their medium is the best one to use and all the others don't work, cut them off because you know, that, that is the, uh, you know, the sign of somebody who's got commission breath. You know, I've, I've worked in television. Television works if you do it right. I work in radio now. Radio works if you use it right. Digital works if you use it right. Print works if you use it right. All of them do, even if I don't benefit from the sale of those things, I know that they can work because I've seen them work. And so anyone who says that nobody listens to the radio anymore or nobody watches TV in the summer, um, you know, nobody reads the newspaper anymore. That's not somebody you want to talk to. You want to talk to somebody who understands what the benefits and uh, and drawbacks are to every medium. Yeah, I think that's great. Someone that understands your business, understands where your your customers are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great because uh, uh, the hard sell or people that are you know just merely commission based that say, uh, yeah, they're they're trying to peg you into doing one you know type of medium to be able to get the message across and yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you kind of said it a lot more poetically than I just yep. did. But it, uh, no, <laughs> that's okay. It's, it is, you know, when, it, when a campaign fails, it is rarely the medium choice. There's usually something else going on, and you want to figure out what that something else is. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Someone actually understands the messaging, simplifying it, and not making sure that they don't make the, you know, the seven deadly advertising mistakes, mm -hmm. which uh, brings me to the last question. Um, how did this book come about? I don't think we ever even got into that at the beginning, but what made you uh, decide to put this together and uh, you know offer this nice you know bit of education for people? Um, I, I <coughs> and I'm going to start over. Uh, I, I think what it was was I kept seeing the same things over and over again, and uh, and I realized that there was a need out there for a a easy to read guide that doesn't get into the weeds, but just talks about the things that are most likely to drive a campaign off the rails. And what the ebook does is a couple of things. Number one, it educates the person who, uh, uh, who reads it. I think you're gonna learn something from it. And when you're done, you're gonna have an idea about what my point of view is and, and what I'm thinking of. And you can get done reading this book and you can either decide, that Phil Bernstein, he knows what he's talking about. I wanna talk to him about advertising with him. Or you don't want to. If you disagree with everything in the book, call somebody else. You, you know that, that's fine too. Uh, I, you know, I, I, Dan Kennedy, the uh, market consultant, says I've had my advice ignored by richer people than you, and uh, and I've always uh, I've always liked that. You know, if, if it doesn't fit your model, there are other people who might. But I think you can read it and say I now understand where this guy is coming from. And then you can decide whether I'm somebody you want to have another conversation with. No, I think that's great, and I think it's good that it has a kind of a definitive, um, you know, kind of uh, slant on it. That you know, it's not vanilla. That it's not mm -hmm. for everyone. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's certain tactics in here that you know work for. I think most people are gonna it's gonna resonate with them. You know, from my understanding, I think it's great. But, I hope but, so. But I think yeah. yeah, I think you you're far enough in your career that you don't need yeah you don't need everyone to like you. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's um, and, and in the marketing world. If ever uh, you don't want to be vanilla, you don't want to just uh, you know cater to the, the masses. You kind of do want to pick pick a side. You want to um, you know you're gonna make if you do pick a side, you're gonna make a lot of people mad. But you're mm -hmm. also gonna make a lot of people happy too. Absolutely. So. At least people know what side you're on. Yeah. So no, I think that's great. Um, 
So how can people get the ebook? Uh, do you have the link on the top of your top of your mind? I do, as a matter of fact. Okay. The, the website is fixadmistakes.com. F-I-X-A-D mistakes.com. And if you go there, there will be a place for you to put your name and email address in. And as soon as you click submit, you get a chance to download that book. It's automated. Uh, so you can do it at 3 in the morning and, and be reading it by 3.15. And uh, you will be subscribing to my newsletter. If you don't want to subscribe to my newsletter, there is an unsubscribe link on every one of them. I won't be insulted much. <laughs> and then uh, how else can we support you, uh, Phil? How else uh, would you like people you know, you know, uh, reach out to you on iHeart or uh, email? Or? Well, the, I mean, the other thing, my contact information is in, the, uh, is in the book. I just told people to have a single call to action. That would be the first one, it's fixadmistakes.com. If you decide you really want to pick up the phone and call me, I'll give you my number, 503-819-8033. That's 819-8033. That's awesome. No, I love it. We, we're making sure we don't make the same mistakes of giving yeah. two people too much, but I like it, kind of a plan A and a plan B, in mm -hmm. case uh, you know, people, you know, I, I'm, I hope your, your phone gets, uh, a lot of people give you phone calls and, and ask I do for as well. So, I'll let you know. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, Phil. Is, is there anything else uh, before we kind of wrap up? That you I think that, I think we've covered it. You know, I'm delighted to be here. I hope uh, what you have heard today is useful for you. If you got questions, let me know. And if you want to argue with me, let me know that. I'm happy to argue. Oh, man. <laughs> Well, you know your stuff. That's why I think you're so willing to uh, to, to go toe to toe with somebody. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for coming onto the show. I you know remember you know seeing you presenting. I was like, ah, I'd love to sit down and have a conversation with uh, Phil Bernstein and just pick his mind about all of this stuff. And um, I, I'm glad that we've been able to you know get this on the calendar right before the holidays. Um, right. So thanks for having me, and uh, good luck with the podcast. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Phil. All right, until next time. All right, thank you. Thank you. I want to say a big thanks for tuning into the Media Marketing Podcast. Please subscribe to get notifications for new episodes, which are coming out every Thursday morning, or at least we're striving for that. Uh, feel free to visit our Facebook page where you can like and join the Media Marketing community. This is a good resource for collaborating, sharing ideas with other media creators, marketers, and those just looking to build their network. So until next time. Thank you.